One of the most common questions I get asked in Flyout, and a hard spot for the community, is piston engines. Flyout, you see, is a pretty high fidelity building game, and while sometimes realism is questionable, I can say that it has higher levels of complexity than any other building game about aircraft. With such fidelity and complexities and relative realism, it's expected that building some of the more complex systems might be a little bit challenging. So today, I'm going to show you guys how to master the piston engine. To test a piston engine, however, we'll need a donor plane, so I want you guys to get acquainted with my plane, the VP-100 Monsoon. This piston engine warbird is designed to simulate a World War II fighter aircraft with the same general weight and flight characteristics as aircraft such as the BF-109 and Spitfire. You can find the video for this aircraft linked in the top right. But it needs a new engine. I've taken both the engine and the propeller out of this aircraft so we can build our own custom prop engine for the vehicle. You guys can either boot up Flyout and follow along with me, or you can just watch and use some of my custom engines. I've made custom designs for engines from general aviation to early airliners to the high-powered warbirds of World War II. Models for induction systems and intercoolers are included, but you guys will need to do the exhaust and intake yourself. So either watch along with me or just download and play around with one of my models, whichever works best for you. I'm not done with all of them, so you guys can expect the pack on my Discord server or the Flyout server in a day or two. But to get on with the video, the first thing you must decide when it comes to piston engines is which fuel you are using. From jet fuel to pure ethanol and various aviation fuels, you've got some options. To make a piston engine aircraft, generally you're looking for fuels with a high auto ignition point, more on that later. Or I suppose you could just say a high resistance to pre-ignition. That narrows your search down to two of the fuels, Avgas 115 and Iso-Octane. Avgas 115 is 115 octane, whereas Iso-Octane is a 100 octane fuel similar to 100 low lead you may find in general aviation. A higher octane means a higher resistance to pre-ignition, which is the same reason why higher performance engines run on 93 octane instead of the regular 87 octane you'd find at the pumps. Since this is a higher performance warplane engine, we'll be using the 115 octane fuel. Was I making a general aviation plane such as a Cessna or a similar build, I would likely use the ISO octane fuel as it has about the same properties as general aviation 100 octane low lead as mentioned earlier. To make an engine more powerful, you need more bang. Or, you know, more combustion if you're a sane human being and don't want to sound weird. The more gas and air you can shove into a combustion chamber, the more power you'll get out of the resulting detonation, assuming the pistons can take it without detonating themselves. Moving on from there, you might notice quite a few different types of engines in flyout. You have radials, inline, and V-type engines. A pretty common misconception is that these different types of engines provide significantly different power than one another, when realistically that's more dependent on bore, stroke, and overall displacement of the engine. The actual configuration mostly affects things such as cooling and balance of the engine, which, conveniently, balance is already pre-sorted for you in flyout. All you really need to worry about is cooling. For example, single or dual roll radial engines are prime candidates for air cooling. Their staggered piston configuration allows for air to travel between each cylinder. Air cooling allows the engine to be lighter, which is why many general aviation craft opt for air cooling as opposed to liquid cooling. Inline and V engines of higher performance, such as the one we are using, are better off for water cooling, which can be switched between along the high landed area. Moving on from there, the bore and stroke are next, which are two of the most important aspects of determining the displacement and power of an engine, along with things like compression ratio. A larger bore means a larger diameter cylinder. Larger diameter means more cylinder volume and more valve area, which means more air, more suck, and more fuel, more bang. More bang equals more power. The absolute easiest way to increase power on an engine is increasing the bore. I hope I'm not too much of a <clears throat> bore with these explanations though. After that comes the stroke. Stroke is the distance that the piston travels up and down in the cylinder. Again, this increases cylinder volume, therefore increasing combustion, but it doesn't necessarily increase power. Since there isn't much room for valve area to improve, you don't always get more power out of an increased stroke. But you might get increased torque and a lower operating RPM instead. You will, however, due to the lower RPM, also sometimes get a reliability bonus with an engine with a higher stroke as well. This is why big diesel or tank engines and most low RPM engines in general employ a higher stroke. This results in three different terms that are very important when it comes to engine dimensions. Over square, square, and under square. Over square refers to when your bore is bigger than your stroke. Square is even, and under square is when your stroke is bigger than your bore. Over square generally results in more power overall, but it has to hold a higher RPM to achieve that power and is also a little bit less reliable. 
Undersquare is the opposite, less power but more torque in the low end and more reliability. In a general sense, of course. That whole reliability thing isn't exactly a law, it's more of a suggestion and it really depends on the engine design. For this engine, I decided to go very slightly over square, just enough for more power while hopefully not sacrificing any reliability on the engine. Not that reliability at the moment is a mechanic in flyout, and, you know, that wouldn't make it an issue anyways. Moving on after that, we had compression, or the squeeze part of the combustion cycle. Higher compression ratios generally equal more power because of the improved thermal efficiency. But there does come a problem with a higher compression ratio, and that is pre-ignition. You see, compressing all that air so aggressively heats it up a lot. If it heats up too much, the fuel-air mixture ignites before it reaches the apex of the compression cycle, resulting in anything from a loss of power to the complete inability to operate the engine. But if you want to get more power out of the engine anyways, well, that's where the fuel comes back in. Let's go back to the octane rating. In an engine, octane rating isn't a rating of fuel, power, or something like that. It's a measurement of auto-ignition point, or rather, how much compression it can take before igniting. Higher octane gasoline has a higher ignition temp, meaning you can compress the fuel-air mixture even more without pre-ignition slowing you down. So when we have iso-octane or 100-octane versus avgas 115 or 115-octane, the 115-octane fuel can compress further without detonation, resulting in more power. This is the same reason why putting higher-grade fuel in your car doesn't change power, because the engine needs to be specifically designed for those higher ignition points for it to actually be affected. On the inverse side of that, if you put lower grade fuel in your car, you could affect its performance and potentially destroy the engine because of that pre-ignition. The other way around this, however, is induction, which we will be including on the aircraft in the form of a supercharger. Forced induction is relatively simple, so I'm not going to waste too much time on it, either driven by mechanical energy in the form of a supercharger, or driven by exhaust gases in the form of a turbocharger, or as they were called during World War II by America, exhaust-driven superchargers. That, that's another story, don't even worry about it. But anyways, a compressor blade spins and generates engine intake pressure separate from the combustion chamber. Basically, it's using some energy from your engine to spin a compressor blade, sort of like a jet engine. This separation from the combustion chamber allows higher temps to be achieved, as there's no fuel in it, while the extra compressed air and extra manifold pressure also allows for more power out of the engine. That means that they can provide even more power than engines without forced induction. This is why really powerful cars almost always have superchargers or turbochargers. Although with planes, they provide a different advantage. We'll talk a little bit more about it in a second, but first I wanted to reduce the compression ratio to about 8.0 to avoid pre-ignition with our newfound two-stage supercharger. Aspirated engines generally have a little bit lower of a compression ratio than engines without forced induction. Moving on from there, the induction adds a bunch of pressure into the intake manifold where you get to set the maximum manifold pressure. Essentially, on some aircraft, the intake manifold dumps out some of the extra pressure generated at low altitudes by the induction system to avoid pre-ignition. As it climbs, due to pressure regulating itself, it slowly dumps less and less of that extra pressure. Basically, this balances out to mean that an engine will not lose power even at significantly higher altitudes. A regular engine, for example, without any induction at all, will lose power with altitude since the air is getting thinner. An aspirated aircraft with forced induction, on the other hand, will keep its power until that manifold pressure equalizes, which can be up to 25,000 feet or over 8 kilometers on some aircraft. This gives a fighter plane such as the Monsoon a significant advantage at altitude, and also it's why so many World War II aircraft featured aspiration systems such as superchargers and those exhaust-driven ones on American planes. Moving down the list from there, the only real things you might need to change are idle throttle and max RPM. Max RPM is pretty easy as there's a power curve tool at the bottom. Just look at the RPM and range and you can set your RPM limit just about over that with no testing required. And with that, we are done with the engine. There's just one thing though. The engine's sole purpose in a plane is to spin a propeller. In between the engine and propeller is the gearbox. So making sure the propeller, gearbox, and engine are all synchronized is crucial to optimal engine performance. Here's how you'd go about that. Let's start with linking the propeller and gearbox. Here we will be using an automatically adjusting constant speed propeller. Constant speed propellers are pretty awesome because if they are set up correctly, they will always sit at just the perfect RPM to generate maximum power out of the engine. I finally adjusted the size a little bit so that with the prop would generate more lift and also a little bit more drag. And with that, my engine was set up and almost ready to go onto an airplane. The last thing was the prop twist. Essentially, a propeller is inherently a spinning object, so the linear velocities between the tip of the prop and the inside of the prop are going to be different from each other. 
since the air is approaching it at a certain velocity and a certain angle, one is going to be going a lot faster than the other and the incidence is going to be different. To solve this, propellers in real life as well as flyout twist themselves with a higher angle at the base to maintain that 5 degree incidence we were measuring earlier. To make this easy, there is a Desmos prop twist calculator online that we can use. And with that, we are done with the airplane. I'll see you guys for the engine test and explain to you how you can use the data from the test to improve your engine. All right, so the very, very, very first thing you want to do is obviously take off in your aircraft. Based on the little prop calculator I made there, best climb for this aircraft should be somewhere around 170 knots, so my goal was to get to that speed. That was the speed where my prop should be just about optimal. We're going to have a little bit less than optimal thrust below that and a little bit less than thrust optimal above that. Obviously, if you twist your prop for different speeds and set it up for different speeds, it's going to be optimal at different speeds. I don't think that came as a surprise to anybody. But what we're really looking for here is that alpha R value that I have highlighted. Keeping that value at exactly, or not exactly, but around 5 while we're at this speed is important. If I am below 5, that means my engine isn't putting out enough power for my blade. I can either shrink the blade, reduce the RPM, or increase engine power. If it's above 5, it's the opposite. That means that the engine is too powerful for the blades. I can do the opposite if that's the case. I can either reduce engine power, increase prop RPM, or increase blade length. Also, another option is adding more blades. For example, if you got a 3 blade and the engine's way too powerful, you can always make it a 4 blade. But ultimately, on this aircraft, things seem to be pretty good. I had to change the weight and balance a little bit because I accidentally messed it up while making this an airframe, but it seemed that our rate of climb was around 28 meters per second, which was very quick for an aircraft of the World War II era. While it is on the higher side of climb rates, it isn't in the territory of impossibility, so I think that means that my engine is just about perfect for the time period. The aircraft also exhibited similar top speed, rate of climb, and speed at altitude values of other World War II aircraft of the time period. This made the Monsoon a perfect World War II, or rather, late World War II fighter, exactly what I intended with the engine. As mentioned before, if you guys aren't too satisfied with this video and you want to play around with some real working piston engines, I am currently developing a piston engine pack. It will not be done by the time this video comes out most likely, I'd expect it maybe a day or two later, but I mean if you're watching in the future, that isn't really a problem. I've got some work in progress screenshots that I've been showing you guys, and ultimately I really hope you guys enjoy. Thanks for watching, I'll see you guys later. Until the next one, and goodbye.